Welcome back. This is episode 10. Crazy, we're 10 episodes in already. Uh, to I Dry Needle to the Point podcast. Uh, I'm your host, uh, I Dry Needle president, Paul Kaloran, physical therapist. And today I'm welcoming uh, one of my good friends. I've known Andreas for years. It feels like probably is almost a decade at this point, but Andreas Olison is a physical therapist. Uh, and the title, the focus of this little 15 minute clinical discussion will be how Andreas works. I, I headlined it with the NFL players, but really he sees NBA, NHL, but really where does dry needling and how does his physical therapy and even his business model work with these top tier elite professional athletes. So Andreas, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for having me. And he's a handsome devil. Can't. <laughs> So yeah, I guess I kind of introduced you, um, physical therapist, you have a lot of training in needling. I mean, all of the levels, you actually do functional fascial dry needling. I know you even went kind of into the acupuncture realm. Uh, you do osteopathic manipulation. Um, but really just, let's start with your story. So what got you into PT? How did you get into like the sports medicine and really the elite athlete side of physical therapy? Yeah, so so I'm originally from Denmark and uh, I took my PT degree about 18 years ago in, in Denmark. So uh, that's uh, I almost got into sports medicine from day one because of my sport. Uh, so I I want to say I still play, but obviously it's a little bit more recreational now, but I used to be very competitive with uh, beach volleyball and uh, was lucky enough to play pro for many years. So um, even it was on a national team level, we were a small country, obviously. So uh, there wasn't a lot of help from like, there was a lot of medical staff. There wasn't a lot of support in that, in that sense. So we had to figure a lot of it out ourselves. So uh, physical therapy kind of became a natural thing to kind of face into because obviously it's not a big sport. You don't make a lot of money of it. So uh, I, I started with physical therapy while I was still playing. And that was a huge benefit because I would kind of take care of myself when there was nobody else to help me. So, yeah, so that has been that uh, degree about 18 years ago in Denmark. Then I moved to the U.S. about 13 years ago and uh, – the U.S. being as lovely as they are, they made me take the whole degree one more time. <laughs> so, uh, so I took it when I came over here and was fortunate enough to to keep working in sports medicine. And uh, mainly because I was lucky enough to team up with some guys that were doing a lot of performance training and I could kind of bring a little bit of the PT side to it. Yeah, that is awesome. I knew you were uh, from Denmark, prof uh, professional beach volleyball player. Uh, and really, I mean, I mentioned a few of your skills. You're a very skilled clinician. Um, and I know personally that needling is a big part of that because I, I was even trying to remember this morning. I'm pretty sure we met like you and I were taking a needling course together probably back 2011, 2012. So I know you've been needling for a long time. Um, in the kind of journey or the course of your career, when did you start needling? How did it change things for you? as far as how you practiced? So I, it kind of came as a, almost like a blessing with the, with the dry needling because I, I worked uh, with these pro athletes and I was very frustrated that I didn't feel I had a lot of tools that could create these rapid changes that the sport, pro sports today require. And then I kind of stumbled across the, the dry needling and had treatment myself before a tournament. And I just couldn't believe the results and uh, how quickly I felt the results and how beneficial it was. And then I kind of started diving into it. And the more I dove into it, um, the good thing is I had along the whole way because um, Ado from Connecticut, he, he laughs a lot of like, I think I've taken some of the levels like multiple times. And he says it's because I fail every time. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but it's simply because I feel like when I and uh, when you and I met, there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of progress. There was a lot of uh, things that was happening in that field. So I felt like some of the causes have changed over the years. And so I feel it's been very like the journey has been very like, organic as it's popular popular to say at the moment it's oh, yeah. been um 
I've been able to kind of implement little by little with these pro athletes. And thankfully, they've all been very susceptible to it. And um, I think the biggest thing for me was that I early on, I think maybe after level one, I was lucky enough to work with a uh, one of the a pass rusher up in with the Baltimore Ravens. And the whole thing kind of like opened my eyes to what the potential was with this dry needling, and especially using it in pro sports, because we, we had this conversation, we had hours and hours of conversation where we were trying to dissect the problem about staying healthy, especially in the NFL, because it's such a brutal sport. And um, the biggest problem, and still to this day, is that people come in, these players come into camp or to preseason being in phenomenal shape and with very little injuries and very little nagging things because they've had this off season to kind of build up and get ready. And then one would think as they get more game reps and more practices with the team, they would get better and better. So when off season, uh, sorry, when pre playoffs come, that they will be at the peak of their game. So they can compete at this high level, highest level. But unfortunately the kind of the curve goes the other way. They get more and more banged up uh, each Sunday. And um, so we, we really try to dissect what could we do to, to reverse this curve and uh, the dry needling kind of fell into my lap when we we're having this discussion. And then we started simply by me going to, to Baltimore every Monday or Tuesday, depending if they had a Sunday or Monday game and simply looking at it as, okay, every Monday we have to presume that this player has been completely banged up and we have to reset everything. Obviously there is very, straightforward things like little ankle sprains, uh, contusions and stuff like that. But let's just presume that the body gets completely banged up in these games and we have to reset it. And then all of a sudden, what was really, really cool for me was that this was not just like, it was a theory, but all of a sudden we could see the results on the field, like constantly week for week. So instead of this guy who was a veteran at that time, and usually it's very common that veterans in the NFL sit down and skip practices. Uh, instead of start skipping practices, he didn't miss a single practice. And out of a sudden, he started getting, as being a pass rusher, he's like his sacks count just went up and up. And he, he exactly what you would think. He got faster, reactive-wise, explosive-wise. There was no bumps in the road. And it was actually to a point where, I, I find it a little funny, but so to the point where the NFL started testing him all the time for – different kind of banned substances because as a veteran, they couldn't believe that he was always on the training field. So that was really, really cool. And I think it was, I think it was around week 11 or 12 where he broke the Baltimore Ravens single season sack record with about six, 16 sacks. And I actually, I remember sitting at a level two course with Edo in Vegas when he actually broke the record. So Edo and I, we were like celebrating in one of the breaks because obviously it was great for all of us that we could see these things are possible with the tools we learn. So, um, yeah, I, I've, I think that that was kind of like the start to the whole thing where I really go like, wow, there's, there's really something to this. That's awesome. First of all, I like the reverse the curve thing, very apropos right now. So, but it makes total sense as far as exactly what you said, like as you want your performance to increase at the end of the season, most of the variables are, are probably driving it downward as far as fatigue, injury, and just the cumulative effect of an NFL season. And you actually almost got to my next question, which is, I know you see these guys in the off season, in the preseason, during the season, and you even said that even beginning of the year to end of the year might change things. How does your dry needling specifically, how do you kind of tailor your treatment to the mesocycle or the, the part of the year that they're in training wise? So it, it's very different. Um, so the way I dry needle is, is obviously the majority of my clientele is NFL. And so within the NFL, it, it varies a lot depending on the position of this guy, the age of this guy, like the younger players, they don't need a lot of maintenance. But with the older players, not only do you have to make sure they stay on the, on the field, you also have to work on some of the compensation patterns that they carry in the back. But, but basically, the, the biggest takeaway, I think, if, if I can, for people out there that want to work with the, with the, um, with the top athletes, and that you really got to be careful. You really got to know when do they have to peak. And 
looking at the compensation patterns, and, and I believe you and I and Ado actually have had these conversations a million times that these guys have so many misalignments and so many compensation patterns. But there's always a time and a place where you treat these, or try to take them away, and the in-season is not it. So, so the off-season, I treat a little bit more aggressive, and not necessarily in my needling technique, but I try a little bit more in the off-season to address these compensation patterns because I have a chance to take some of these dysfunctional pillars away and then build some new ones through corrective training and corrective exercises. But during the season, you got to be very, very careful what you mess with because out of a sudden you go like, oh, this guy has an offensive lineman, has a limited internal rotation in his hip. Let's fix it. And then out of a sudden he gets tackled on the outside and that's instead of that, what I call protective tightness is holding him, is protecting that knee. Then out of a sudden to go like, if you gave him more, boom, it's an ACL injury. So it's very, very tricky that you know what kind of things you want to take away at certain aspects of the year. So I treat very, very different. Yeah, that makes, on the year. that makes sense. And I, I, that's a great example. I like the protective tightness. I like that term too. Um, there's this time and a season to work on that dysfunction. And then, like you said, there's a time in the season where it's maintenance or just keeping them uh, more of a recovery focus, I guess. Another more specific question to your dry needling. I mean, we're getting kind of close to the playoffs right now. Um, how soon before a game and how immediately after a game do most NFL guys prefer to be treated with needling? So again, it varies a little bit depending on who, who you're dealing with. But um, in a lot, a lot of times, it's like it's, it's, it can be difficult to do exactly what you as a PT would like to do because there is uh, travel included, there's their schedule, there's, there's a lot of factors. But um, with some of my guys, I see them on a Tuesday and I see them on a Friday. And simply because... A lot of times, like I would say Monday would be the best, <laughs> the best day to start things up to kind of the beginning of a new week. And you, you're dealing with all these things that happen in the game on a Sunday. But for most of them, they have to be with the team in the facility getting their mandatory treatments on Mondays. So Tuesday will be their day off. So Tuesday, we kind of, uh, we kind of evaluate what happened in the game. We try to reset some of these patterns I was talking about earlier. And we try to address some of these small injuries that almost always happens. Then when Friday comes along, then it's time to tune up if there's something that resurfaced during the week. And uh, Friday is kind of, for me, the last time I want to needle. Because just in case I'm not on top of my game and I leave a little bit of soreness, I don't want it to affect them on Sunday. So for me personally, in my experience, I let Friday be the deadline where we do a last little tune up and not as aggressive. Uh, uh, needling on Friday versus, for example, on a Tuesday, where we're really trying to reset everything. Yeah, that makes sense. And I know, I assume you'd agree with this. One of the ways we know we can kind of mitigate how sore we leave them, there's obviously a, a dosage spectrum, how many needles, how aggressively you manipulate the needle, but it's also the use of stim. And first of all, if you don't already follow Andreas on Instagram, it's just at Andreas Olison PT. Um, you post your needling treatments quite a bit. And I know you use, I mean, the best stim unit out there. You actually have two of them, double barreled ITO ES160, that six channel stim unit. Hey so I know it. <laughs> I, I avoided because it costs so much like early in my career, I avoided buying it for so long, but as soon as I did, it, it changed how I treated. But uh, I know it varies on the athlete and really your treatment intent, but give us one specific, I guess, STEM. I don't like the word protocol, but how do you use the STEM unit specifically for a certain effect? Yeah. So, so in more in regards to, so for example, on a, on a Tuesday, and uh, let's say we're dealing with a wide receiver. Um, a, lot of, a lot of times I'll focus a lot on the hips, on the anterior hip compartment. And what I do is a lot of how I treat. And again, we don't like to use the word protocol, but the way I address it based on my practical experience, it doesn't always line up with 
what the research says. And obviously, it's we, we want to do re research backed treatment, but at the same time, sometimes my practical experience have shown me otherwise. So the way, at least the way I use it is, I usually like to use these stimulants, obviously, because not only comfortable wise, they give us a lot of parameters we can use and they are expensive, but it's an investment. And, you know, as well as I do, the, those things come back to you. Yeah. But as for the specific of a, of a stim, if I work on, for example, on a, on a TFL or a rec fim, something anterior hip related, then I would start at a, about six hertz and I kind of like to see how the muscle responds to that six hertz because a six and five or six hertz we can still see how the muscle is contracting and if somebody has gotten a hip contusion or something like that in the game you would directly see that that muscle is not has a really hard time keeping up with that frequency so a lot of times i let it sit simply let it sit until i can see it's following that frequency so and that's my way of like resetting it making sure optimizing that the muscle is firing how i want it to so when I get to that point that it could take anywhere from a couple of minutes to like sometimes if there is an injury, it can take up to five, six, seven, eight minutes. Once I see I have that nice contraction that I like to see and it's following the frequency, then I start building it up towards seven, eight, nine, and 10 until the muscle almost fatigues out, especially because I want that anterior hip combine to be nice and loose for this wide receiver. So they have that knee drive. So there's no external rotation once they get to that knee flexion because that translates to how they plant their foot in the sprint but a defensive tackle it's a little different because the way they place their feet they're a little bit more active with their arms so it it, it varies but for a wide receiver i i usually start with with six make sure it's firing and then i build it up to the muscle almost fatigues out and that's something i've had really good results with us also with my with my nba guys and the good thing is like you say Obviously, we would have, I know you love the term being a sniper, right? You really got to be have your palpation skills down because the biggest thing with these guys is if you leave them sore and if they feel any kind of soreness on a Sunday, if you treat them on a Friday, they will not use you. You get one chance with these guys. So your palpation skill has to be money. And because if you, if you get these good tw uh, twitches with your really precise I'm not big on using a lot of pistoning. So once I get that twitch very quickly, stim on, and most of the time these guys are not sore. That's awesome. High stakes needling. I like, here's, <laughs> I can listen to you talk all day. It's so hard. We're already past time. Um, so I, I'll, let's do one parting question um, because I was this person, that PT student. I got into PT similarly. I was a college football player my own injuries, my own interest and fascination with like the body's resilience and ability to rehab itself was what got me into PT versus I was thinking kind of um, MD, like uh, medical school. So really it was my dream job when I was that PT student, like I just kept saying, I wanna work with the high level athletes, work with the high level athletes. Um, not many of us actually do. So you kind of have that dream job working exclusively with these high level professional athletes. So as we last question, give the listeners kind of one thing that you love about the realm you're living in and one challenge to working exclusively with these pro athletes. I mean, the one thing I love is I'm very, very competitive. And even though I stopped competing in my own sport, um, I love competing in this sports medicine. So the, the fact I love that when the stakes are high, I love that I'm the one that gets the call when some of the team staff can't figure it out. And I love that I have to come up with these things that nobody really knows how to, to fix. And then I think what I love the most is like it translates straight over on the field. So I love them. In my work, I can see the result in their stat line. I mean, I'm not sitting the whole Sunday watching football, watching all my guys play because I like to spend time with my family too. But at the end of the day, football being a statistic sport, I can at least go in and see that the number looks great. So obviously, I, I can control what I can control. If they drop the ball, it's a little bit, I can't, I can't control that. But I love that my work directly translates to what you see on ESPN on Sunday. The challenging thing is, I think like we touched base on earlier, is that it's 
it's you don't get a lot of chances with these guys and you you really gotta you gotta be the salesperson as well you gotta sell them the idea of investing in their body and staying on top of it and not just using you when they hurt when actually be proactive and i think that's that that's one thing we have to learn as pts we have to be better at selling ourselves and then i don't one thing also i don't think we have to be afraid of being spe- specialist and specialist in in a certain area you see the mds you have a angle angle knee specialist you have a hip shoulder specialist and everything and then like i i like that i am the dry needling guy in sports medicine and then obviously you and i know dry needling can't stand alone you got to have something to bag it up but a lot of times you don't get the chance with these guys and uh, it's just important to have a good relationship with their trainers their medical staff bury the ego and just be open open communication and then whatever you do with them you refer it on so the trainers know that you're working with them and they can do some of these corrective exercises but the biggest challenge is there's not a lot of margin for error yeah i believe that last question do you do you uh, participate in fantasy football because that's not really fair no, I no, no, <laughs> no, I don't because I'm still European, and uh, my knowledge about football is is still very embarrassing. <laughs> so I I tried one year to join some of my friends' uh, fantasy football league, and after too many questions during the draft night, they did simply say like, "No, I don't think this is for you." And I, so no, I don't. But. Uh, <laughs> That is, thank you, Andreas. We are past time so for hanging with us for a, a little extra. Uh, again, if you don't follow him already, we'll, we'll post it in our Instagram, but you should follow him on Instagram at Andreas Olison, not Olson. There's an extra E in there. He's from Denmark. Um, but you can catch the recording anywhere. Uh, we'll have a link in our Instagram profile. You can find our YouTube channel. We're on Spotify and iTunes. Um, but Andreas, Great seeing you. Thanks so much for your time. Likewise, buddy. Appreciate it. The NFL PT, the PT to the stars. Uh, so give him a follow. Next week, we have, we have one more to the point this year. We have Judy Galber uh, at Movement Physio or at Forward Movement uh, Physio. And we'll talk everything, coaching, mindset. She does, uh, she needles, but she also treats CrossFitters and she coaches PTs and kind of the, the well-being mentorship side of things. So catch us one more time next Wednesday to to the point. Then we'll kind of take a break uh, until next year. Andreas, have a great week. Everyone else, thanks for listening. You too, buddy. Thanks a lot.